Hello and welcome to Showcase, coming to you from our studios in Istanbul. Motorcycles and wood with a touch of creativity. Later in the show, we'll introduce you to a man that creates sculptures to put his village on the map and speak to the founder of the new Academy nonprofit organization to understand the importance of the Nobel Prize for Literature. But first, Rock, Paper, Samarkand. An Uzbek entrepreneur revives the ancient art of paper making. We'll see artists at work in an ancient Lebanese city. And the electronic sounds of Senegal will introduce you to the music of Ibaku. Senegalese musician Ibaku got his big break when he provided the score for fashion designer Selly Rabe Kane's Catwalk Show. The album Alien Cartoon started a new wave of music that came to embody the term Afrofuturism. Our Miranda Addy was lucky enough to meet Ibaku during her trip to Senegal. And here's what he told her about his love of music and why he'll always stick close to his roots. The context of the fashion collection was an African city invaded by aliens and uh, when, we, when we released the album, when we start to uh, think about it as an album, I, uh, imag I imagined myself as a, a character in that city. So, uh, Jula Dance, it's uh, a sequence of, of that story that I'm telling in the, in the album. So, it's, it's the story of my parents. My mother is an alien and my father is a human. And uh, the, the prequel of the, of the story, like, they, they, they met some, somewhere in the, in, the, in the cosmos and uh, they interact together. The term Afrofuturism is connected a lot with your work. People always talk about you and they talk about Afrofuturism together. But what does that term mean to you? And do you think that does describe your sound? For me, it's a responsibility as, as an African, a young African, to, to bring my perspective on this, this subject uh, from the continent because it, uh, it, it, was, uh, it started in the, in the, in the States and uh, in some other contexts. So right now, when you, when I, uh, when people, t when I talk about Afrofuturism, I want to bring my perspective, like the perspective of a young Senegalese. Uh, I don't want to be stuck in one ca in, in 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 one genre or one on one world. You know, it's it's um, for me. It's more than that. It's more than. But I really, I'm really, really proud to 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 be in that movement because I was, I was inspired by people like Sun Ra, from Sun Ra to Erika Badu. How does Senegal, how does Dakar inspire your music? The, our relationship with, with, with technology, it's, it's, uh, I think it's really pretty different, pretty really different because we, we use it in different ways to bring some solutions for for the lack of water, for the lack of electricity, for education. The, the relationship we have with our our culture, as as a, as a modern society, as young young uh, young Africans. So yeah, it's a mix of all those layers, you know. What's the local reaction to your music? We were really surprised because. People really, uh, really appreciated the the sounds, the the way we did it, the, the visuals, and all that. But uh, at the at the um, also also uh, a lot of people don't understand it because it's still some something really experimental, alternative. You're about to embark on your first African tour. 
Where are you going to be visiting? We're going to play in, uh, in Saint Louis here in Senegal. We're going to play in, uh, in Nairobi. We're going to play in uh, South Africa, Johannesburg, uh, Rwanda, Ethiopia. So it's, uh, yeah, for me it's a dream coming true. You know, it's a dream coming true because, as I said, you know, it's this project talk to, to talk to the continent first, you know. So um, for me, it was really important to 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 uh, to perform it in different countries of. Of, of, of the continent. Le ciel est beau, le sun cogne même quand c'est pas midi king. J'en place une pour mes gars de Pikina, Medina, Baobab, Gejewai, toute la famille dans les six caps et toute la diaspora des lions, Folech Babylon, Names, Philippe, Ibaku. Pra! Lebanon's greatest Roman treasure, Baalbek, is considered a wonder of the ancient world. And it's just hosted the first Baalbek International Symposium, gathering artists from around the world who found inspiration in the city's Roman temples and ancient ruins. Nearly 20 sculptors and painters worked for two weeks to create art inspired by the city's history. They traveled from 13 countries, including China, Mexico, and Georgia, for the first Baalbek International Symposium, an event that aims to reflect the historical, cultural, and social dimensions of the City of the Sun. You know, I, what, what can I do for this uh, city? Because I know this city, the name is, uh, 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 how to say, the City of the Sun. So, so I make uh, I make my sculpture for connected to the to this reason. So this meaning water from sky. Uh, so I, also I know here is uh, probably for the water. So I want the water falling down for this beautiful city. The works of the artist will be on display in and around Baalbek. This forum is very important. It allows artists from all over the world to communicate. It creates dialogue and exposes us to new experiences. On the other hand, Baalbek is an important city that inspires me. You can't ignore this place. I'm very happy to be here, so I benefited from the inspiration of the place to create this painting with objects and paint. Organizers hope the event will reignite interest in Baalbek's culture and its art, as well as stimulate tourism in the region and in Lebanon. Paper is dead. Well, that's what some of us might feel in today's digital society, and it makes sense as recycling and saving trees could go a long way to saving our ecosystem. However, one entrepreneur has been making an ancient kind of paper, just like they did all those years ago. Named after the city it was produced in, we have a look at what makes Samarkand so Samarkand. In a small village of Kony Gil, about five kilometers away from the Uzbek Silk Road city Samarkand, a lost ancient art is being slowly revived. Over the last five years, tourists have been coming to this workshop to see a process they believed had been lost to the 19th century. This is the only workshop in Central Asia that produces handmade paper called Samarkand from mulberry trees. My job is to remove the bark from the branch. We're preparing the semi-finished product and then the guys start making the paper from this bark. Persian and Arabic manuscripts were written on Samarkand in the 9th and 10th centuries due to its quality. Its history goes back to the year 751, when the city's local forces faced off with the incoming Chinese army. In the early Middle Ages, the Chinese invaded Central Asia, but the city of Samarkand defeated them. Some of the Chinese troops were taken prisoners. Among them, there were masters in the art of making paper. And so the Khorasan governor, Abu Muslim, in return for saving their lives, requested that they disclose their secret craft. We 
We've read about it in the encyclopedia. We've heard about it in different stories. There were verses saying that the Samarkand paper was better because it was polished. In other countries, like in Korea, Japan, or China, the paper was not polished because they used brushes. Zarab says, to set up the factory, he had to borrow from friends, family, and even sell his car and wife's gold. For a while, he bought mulberry branches from a farmer, but now grows his own trees on leased land. Every year in the winter time, we cut off one-year branches of mulberry trees, soak them in water. We then remove the bark, after which the brown-colored upper layer is scrubbed away. When everything has been cleaned, we start boiling the bark in the cauldron. This takes four to five hours. And in this age of digital technology, the factory has enjoyed plenty of interest. Zarif says they welcome more than 5,000 tourists a year. That, despite having no website. Shiraz Ali, TRT World. Still to come on Showcase, Sweden ushers in the new academy. An alternative academy is set to revive a literary award shaken by scandals of sexual misconduct. Carved from the tree of life, we'll visit a gallery in Lebanon packed with unique motorcycles. And we look at how artists are transforming the suburbs of Paris. We'll bring you those stories later in the show, but first, here is a quick look at a few other ones that caught our attention. Just a day after it came under fire, Australian newspaper The Herald Sun has reprinted the controversial cartoon of U.S. tennis star Serena Williams under the headline, Welcome to the PC World. The cartoon depicts Williams throwing a tantrum at last week's U.S. Open final. Well-known figures, including J.K. Rowling, have condemned the cartoon as racist and gender biased. But its illustrator, Mark Knight, says it's only about Williams' on-court behavior. Archaeologists in Luxor say a manuscript discovered in an Italian library two years ago offers clues into an unlikely influence on the Renaissance. The 17th century document features a thesaurus to decipher ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. They believe it could shed light on the ancient Egyptian impact on the Italian Renaissance, mostly attributed to Greek and Roman influences. French-based Algerian singer Rashid Taha, who's best known for French rock and Algerian rai music, has died at the age of 59 from a heart attack. According to the Le Parisien Journal, his death has been revealed by his family members. Taha rose to global fame in the 1980s with songs like Ya Raya and Ida. He had been working on a new album and planning to release it early next year. In November last year, 18 women accused Jean-Claude Arnaud of sexual harassment and physical abuse. He's a Swedish photographer and married to an Academy member. It's alleged that some of those misconducts took place at properties owned and funded by the Academy. This was followed by similar accusations leveled at other members of the Swedish Academy. And it was finally announced that for the first time in nearly 70 years, there will be no Nobel Prize in Literature in 2018. I think it's uh, the correct decision uh, for the Academy to take. Uh, we need to, to have a time out and to think about how to reorganize the Academy and to um, make um, the, prize, uh, um, the prize that it has been when all this started. Uh, I'm kind of ashamed as a Swedish uh, about the whole situation in the academy. So an independent initiative has stepped in and set up a platform for this year's literary award. Swedish librarians have submitted their nominations and after a worldwide open voting, an independent jury of writers and librarians will announce the winner on October 12th. 
and following a grand celebration on December 9, the new academy will be dissolved. To speak about just how big of an impact this will have on the literary world, I'm joined by Alexandra Pascalidou. She is the founder of the New Academy, which is the nonprofit organization looking to find this year's alternative Nobel Prize winner for literature. Thanks for being with us today, Alexandra. Now, tell me why the Swedish Academy decided uh, not to give out a prize this year. Well, they have many reasons for that. We had uh, a situation where uh, I mean, we were like hearing about so many accusations of uh, sexual assault, sexual harassment after the Me Too campaign. And there were so many, uh, like 18 women accusing somebody. And then we also had um, cases of corruption and lack of transparency and leaks and so on. So they had many, many scandals. It was like a drama going on. Yeah. And suddenly one day they just announced that they were going to cancel the Nobel Prize of this year. And uh, probably because they couldn't really make it, there were only 10 members left. And also because they had, I mean, their, their credibility as an institution was also uh, severely injured. Well, tell me exactly about the function uh, that the new academy has. I mean, we started the new academy because we had enough. We were tired of following all these scandals and we thought that something new, something fresh, we really wanted, we, we, we think that, I mean, literature is not, and authors are not the ones that are going to pay the price for what these uh, guys have done in the Swedish Academy. And that we want to uh, give literature the chance and the importance it really has in the world of today, where we see that the space is shrinking and that the free word is threatened. Well, tell us about the award process. Uh, how will the winner be chosen and when will this information be released? You know, democratizing uh, an award, an international award, what we wanted to do, do was like include all the people and make people around the world from Turkey to Tajikistan or to Colombia to feel that the Literature Prize is something that they can uh, influence and it's their business too. So we ask librarians in Sweden to nominate uh, their favorite authors, they did. And then the nominations with the most of the vote, and I mean, resulted in a long list with 47 authors. And among these uh, 47 authors, people from around the world could vote for their favorite authors. So we received within only one month without any kind of marketing, without any commercials or any ads or anything, we received 33,000 almost votes from around the world. And now we have an expert jury and, and they are studying the four finalists, four authors that people from around the world and the librarians have voted for. Well, Alexandra, do you think it's shocking that we have Neil Gaiman and Haruki Murakami on the shortlist? Well, I think it is a surprise for many of us, and we we won't. I mean, we can't also forget, you know, Marisa Conde from Guadeloupe and uh, Kim Tuyen from the Vietnamese Can Canadian author too. But people were very surprised, and some people were not surprised at all. So it depends. I am personally very, very happy that we have like such a diversity and uh, among these writers. They are so different and they live in so many, in so different places in the world. Mm -hmm. Now, do you think that the Swedish Academy will ever gain its reputation back? You know, I don't know. And I really don't want to know anything more about the Swedish Academy because you know what's happening is really, really embarrassing. I mean, I am of Greek origin. I live in the most equal country in the world, in one of the most modern democracies. And this is not really decent. What's happening right now within the Swedish Academy is not really what we thought uh, uh, is like suitable for Sweden. So many of us are really, really embarrassed for what's happening the reasons that we want to start something new, something open, something diverse, and we welcome anybody, I mean, people watching your show, uh, anybody around the world to contribute, to be part of this initiative and to, and to help, because I really think that 
we need to change what we cannot accept. Lastly, Alexandra, tell me about uh, the jury members of the Alternative Nobel Prize. You can Prize. see it on, the, on www.thenewacademy.se. We have like very, very, four, very professional people. And one is like professor in literature and another, you know, they're like, they've been working with literature you know, for a very, very long and experienced. So we really, really trust them. And um, the result or the name uh, will be announced the 12th of October at 12 o'clock in the State Library in Sweden, in Stockholm. All right, Alexandra, thank you so much for joining us today on Showcase. Thank you so much. Tasha Kurdi. Bye bye. Our next story is about a man who doesn't know how to ride a motorcycle, but who's obsessed with them enough to make one. Salam Hamza is a Lebanese craftsman who has opened a gallery of replica motorcycles, and he makes them using a material you might not associate with such a powerful machine. A piece of sandpaper and hard work. That's all Selam Hamzeh needs to put the finishing touches on his latest wooden creation. He makes replicas of motorcycles and even carves the rider sometimes, as he's doing now. Hamzeh has built more than 20 wooden bikes so far. He displays them in his own gallery in the village of Abe, Mount Lebanon. The idea was to dwell at my village Abe. I was thinking what should I do to attract tourists. Once, I went to Beirut, where I saw a policeman with his motorbike, which I liked. The first time, I hand-carved the motorbike from my imagination. Then I searched the internet and made this big haul of unknown motorcycles. Hamze uses up to a thousand pieces of wood for big motorcycles and around 250 pieces for smaller ones. I started with the first ever motorcycle of 1885 that was produced by the Germans and also the 1902 Harley Davidson and gradually I continued. I found that between 1902 and 1920 the motorcycles did not change. Then I did the 1942 model and the 2000 model. Some people have brought their motorcycles to me to make identical wooden ones. Hamze hopes more people will visit his site and see his works that could also help put his village on the tourist map. Most Parisians have traditionally avoided the suburbs of Paris due to their high population and crime rates. But now, artists are putting in a meticulous effort to change the face of the suburbs with art spaces welcoming people from all corners. The Paris suburb of Seine-Saint-Denis is generally known as an immigrant ghetto with a high crime rate. But these days, it's slowly turning into a hipster oasis. This is all because of new art spaces popping up in the area. One of these places is La Halle Papin, where around 100 artists give abandoned sites a new lease of life. There are a number of craftsmen here. There are jewelers, fashion designers, welders. It's also an opportunity for us to meet people in other fields to enrich what we make here. What started out as a one-year project has turned this area into an inspiring and affordable place for artists who now have enough space to organize all sorts of workshops. La Al Papin will close in January to make way for the renovation of the neighborhood but La Cité Fertile, or the Fertile City, is just around a kilometer away. It's a project site that spans tens of thousands of square meters across a former freight terminal. Once complete, it will include an urban agricultural space. People are invited to experience a slow life where they can take a moment to escape the urban bustle to connect with nature, music, recreational activities, books, and art. We want to explore the city of tomorrow, to evolve our idea of the city of tomorrow. And to do that, we want to invite collectives, groups, companies and local councils. A number of players who can think and who want to build this city. More virtuous, more pleasant, a better city really. So far, their project seems to be working. 
Dozens of spaces like these have popped up in the neighborhood of Saint-Saint-Denis alone. Last year, nearly 20,000 people visited the art spaces, many of them Parisians. For them, the ring road around the capital was once a psychological barrier, but now they've become gateways for their great escape. We've come to the end of another episode of Showcase. Don't forget to check out our YouTube channel for more stories about the global art scene from our team here at Showcase. I'm Efnan Han. Thanks for joining us. Bye for now.